Uh, thanks very much, Carl. I certainly appreciate the invite to talk today. So I'm going to give a, a brief overview of some international examples of shellfish reef restoration, which is really exciting to see what's happening globally, to give you some perspective of your, your success locally as well. Uh, first of all, I definitely would like to acknowledge the wonderful work that's happening in the Haraki Gulf in terms of the marine spatial planning and also revive our gulf. Uh, Raywin Pert came and spoke in Melbourne uh, last year. Uh, Victoria is looking at embarking on a marine uh, spatial plan and to hear Raywin speak about the process here certainly provide a lot of inspiration and is certainly seen by others as a global example about how to go about it, particularly about um, involving community. I get to wrestle with this now. <laughs> so, Shellfish Reef started around 20 years ago in the US. It was originally driven by a decline in the fisheries, so it was sort of thought about in terms of bringing back the fish, and also in terms of, um, there was a lot of polluting industries in the US at the time, so the EPA started a, a fund called the Super Fund, and essentially it was fining major industries for polluting tributaries, bays and estuaries, and forcing them to recover the habitats, which included uh, restoration. So this was the first time that we started thinking about valuing restoration, valuing habitats, including shellfish reefs, and what benefits they can bring to both nature and people. So, that was in, since then, 2014, there's been a global um, explosion of projects. And I think the bottom line is, when you're thinking about projects, it's also the importance of community. A lot of the projects in the US started off by involving small community projects, and that continues to be the theme both in the US and also, and also in Australia, obviously locally here as well. So when you're starting up a project, you really need to involve community, be it the traditional owners, marine care groups, fishers or others, and also creating practical opportunities for people to be involved. May it be building reefs, um, monitoring reefs, or even um, starting up a shell recycling project, recycling shells from seafood wholesalers and restaurants to use, use as, sea, um, use as uh, reef base. So, there's now around 170 projects in the US that's led by the Nature Conservancy, and another 190 that are led by ANOA, uh, a, a government institution over there. Another reason why there was a big explosion in res uh, restoration projects in the US was the Obama administration, uh, similar to what happened in Australia, they developed an economic stimulus package to help um, counteract the recession. Uh, the Nature Conservancy and some other major groups appro approached, uh, approached the administration and said, hey, why not spend some of this money on restoration? Why not spend some of this money on blue infrastructure? Because building reefs is, is really um, good for jobs as well. So essentially they leveraged $100 million from the Obama administration that went, then went towards building a number of what you call shovel-ready projects throughout the US. So as you can see from the slide here, restoration projects stack up extremely competitively against other projects, be it mining or gas or major uproads. So per $1 million spent, it creates at least 8.5 full-time equivalent jobs. Compared to mining, that's 2.5 major uproads, um, upgrades a road, that's 5.9. So this has not only been ground truthed in the US, but also been ground truthed in South Australia, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, one of the big flagship projects in the US is in Chesapeake Bay. This is a, uh, a bay system that borders Washington, uh, DC. There was an executive order in 2011 to basically bring back the health of, of Chesapeake Bay, so to restore clean water, recover habitats, sustain fish and wildlife. So this includes restoring eelgrass and oyster populations in 10 estuaries by 2025. And one of the main estuaries where the work's now completed was the Harris Creek estuary. Uh, so that work started in 2011. 
Uh, they've already originally, those 200 hectares of shellfish reefs in this tributary, they've restored 142 hectares and they've used 2.5 billion spat on shells. So this area is both substrate and recruitment limited. So they need to build the reef base, which they've used stone and shell, and then seed that reef base with hatchery reared oysters. And the cost of this project was around $50 million uh, US. So this year they released a regional economic analysis, and this is for the um, Chop Tank River complex, which includes Harris Creek and two other tributaries. And as you can see, there's been a considerable increase. There's a 100% increase in blue crab production. Uh, there's $7.8 million in terms of labour income. Commercial fisheries are, are definitely benefit. Recreational fisheries have benefit, benefited. So if you consider Harris Creek cost $53 million, already they've already recouped the cost of just Harris Creek. So heading to the future, there's a really strong business case, both socially and, and um, socially environmentally, of why you want to restore shellfish reefs. Now, let's move internationally around the world. So, in Hong Kong, uh, there are two smaller polar projects. So, this is, a, this is called Deep Bay. This is a 600 square metre uh, polar reef. They're using rough uh, concrete posts. As you can see, there's, it's a really soft sediment, so it's a really challenging area to restore shellfish reefs. So, they're inserting these rough concrete posts into the sediment. This area is uh, this is assisted, assisted regeneration, so there's still plenty of oysters in the system that are going to naturally colonise these concrete posts. And from what I can gather, the success has already been um, quite strong. And then moving to China, there's two polar projects in China as well. And this area here is the Seimen Reef in the Xinjiang province, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, which is quite close to Shanghai, bordering the East China Sea. So this is another assisted regeneration site where they're placing patches of stones around a one hectare footprint. And there's also enough oysters in this system, the Crashostria species, to naturally colonise um, these patch reefs. So small pilot projects to develop a proof of concept and then uh, leverage more funding to build more reefs. And then moving to uh, UK, so currently there's five uh, shellfish reef rest restoration sites in the United Kingdom, um, including Glenmorangie. If anyone likes the whiskey, they would have heard of the Glenmorangie Distillery. So the, the Glenmorangie Distillery is collaborating with uh, an NGO uh, and a university to restore reefs in that area. It's a really fantastic example of a, of a company that has a sense of place, they've been in this area since 1843, a stewardship to the area, and they're paying for shellfish reef restoration. Uh, we're currently drawing up our performance development objectives, so I've certainly penciled this in for a site visit. I think it's really important I visit Glenmorangie to see what's happening there firsthand. This photo here is from Essex in the UK. I don't know if anyone's been to Essex before. This is a, a Similar pilot type project, it's a 1,200 square metre site, a full reconstruction site, so they're both building a, a reef base out of stone, then seeding it with, uh, with hatchery reared oysters. The species here is Austria edulis, um, similar to the Austria chiliensis species that's in New Zealand and also the Austria angazi species that's in my home turf. And in Europe, there's currently five sites that are restoring shellfish reefs. Uh, Dutch practitioners are collaborating with large-scale offshore wind farms, basically to help make that wind farm structures more habitat friendly. So they're actually building oyster reefs on the basis of the wind farm um, bases. So essentially, obviously wind farms provide some environmental good in terms of renewable energy, but sometimes the habitat value is quite limited, so they're helping to improve that. And thank you to Sean Lee for this photo. Um, it's a quick photo of the Haraki Gulf. Wonderful work that's happening now. Rebecca's already covered off, off on that already. Uh, moving to South Australia, this is uh, Windara Reef, which is the local indigenous name for this area. It's a 20 hectare project, 
Also for, re for reconstruction, where they're placing rock on the sediment and then seeding with hatchery reared oysters. So it's a 20 hectare site. Originally, South Australia had at least 1,500 square kilometres of reefs. So there's a 20 hectare pro um, project here. Uh, Anita Netasico, colleague in South Australia, she's got a 2.5 hectare project in Adelaide Metro, and then she's embarking on a statewide strategy for shellfish reef restoration as well. And then moving to Port Phillip Bay, uh, my patch. I've got a, a video, so rather than listen to me for 15 minutes, I'll get to show a video about what's happening in Port Phillip Bay. Shellfish reefs once covered up to half of Port Phillip Bay's seafloor. By the late 1800s, they were largely locally gone. Overexploited to the extent that the shellfish reef ecosystems started to collapse. In more recent years, overharvesting, catchment to coast pollution, and sedimentation plus disease have all contributed to these reefs not being able to recover. We're determined to bring back uh, the lost ecosystem, these shellfish reefs, uh, back into Port Phillip Bay uh, so that we can bring back more fish, cleaner water, uh, and more life. Uh, back in Port Phillip Bay. We're doing this using a number of different techniques, including using limestone and recycled seafood shells to form a base which we then seed hundreds of thousands of hatchery grown Australian flat oysters and blue mussels. So these reefs offer us a small window into the past. In just a short period of time, life has really returned. We've seen schools of pinky, a baby snapper, little reef fish like pygmy leather jackets and hula fish, as well as the sorts of invertebrates that are really important for the bottom of the food chain, like sea stars and urchins, and even uh, octopus, top predators and seals. Since 2015, we've restored 1.5 hectares of shellfish reefs. This is equivalent to the size of the MCG. As many as 60 to 85% of the seeded oysters are surviving on the shellfish reefs. What is more exciting is that we're starting to see oyster hatchlings beginning to settle on the reef. This is real confirmation that we're doing something right. As the oyster populations of our reefs are able to complete their life cycle, surviving, growing, reproducing and attracting baby oysters back to settle on the home that the reefs provide. So it's these ecosystems that are the foundation for life. They're bringing back fish, they're bringing back uh, all the little crabs and crustaceans uh, that you see in the sand uh, and we want to breathe new life back into Port Phillip Bay. We are also providing opportunities for local communities to be involved, helping us measure and count oysters on the reef monitor baby hatchlings in the wild and cleaning and bagging up recycled shell to settle oyster hatchlings on before we release them onto the reefs. So if we're able to restore these shellfish reef ecosystems, uh, in the future they're going to be able to filter the equivalent of the entire city of Melbourne's wastewater, acting like a huge biological filter, really cleaning up the water in Port Phillip Bay. Now, I didn't get time to cover off on all the projects in Australia. There's also a lot of work happening in WA. Uh, Fiona Bellasini here, the state coordinator, is working on that, and also Al Cunningham. So there's work in Perth metro type area and also down in, in Albany. And just to finish off my talk, to go back through it, excuse me. So for the last year and a half, uh, I've been a project managing a, a new publication called the Restoration Guidelines for Shellfish Reefs. It's, a, it's an update of a 2006 publication which was largely US centric, so at that stage in history the shellfish reefs were largely just being restored in the US. So it's a high level guide, um, the A to Z of how to restore shellfish reefs through from um, leveraging funding, biosecurity and permitting, feasibility studies, scale up, monitoring and communication. So this is due to be uh, released in a couple of weeks, so the pressure's on to get it done in time. And not only there's a lot of written content, there's also some wonderful sort of infographics that 
demonstrates the, the value of shellfish reefs um, to both nature and people. Uh, there is authors from around the world, uh, including Andrew Jeffs, who's quite prominent here uh, in New Zealand. So the idea is to give a proper global perspective on how to restore shellfish reefs. And thank you very much for the photographers, including Sean and my co-authors for the restoration guidelines. And I've probably used up my time, but thank you very much. I've got one question. Yes. Please make it two questions. Yes. Yeah, so there's a few different um, regulations. So it's the Department of Environment, Water, Planning and Environment. Probably not pronouncing that properly. Anyway, um, DELP. So they so basically you require a Coastal Management Act consent to restore reefs. And then to actually build reefs, I require a works permit from Parks Victoria to actually build the reefs. And in terms of the shell recycling, there's a different set of guidelines for that. Oh yeah, sorry, so there was, a, there was a feasibility study that looked at the original extent of shellfish reefs in the bay, so up to 50% of the bay's seafloor was once dominated by oyster reefs and mussel reefs. So through that feasibility studies, sites were selected, both on historical uh, extent and also different environmental factors. Um, the next step is to undertake some more sophisticated spatial modelling to look at sites in the bay. So look at 20 hectares of restoration the next three years and then for another 100 hectares which is around 10% a restorable bottom.